Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Entrepreneurship Facts. And today I invited a special guest for all of you. His name is Cody Laughlin. And well, I let him introduce himself to all of you and to learn a little bit more about his background, his story, and and learn something useful. He's a very knowledgeable guy. So, Cody, can you quickly um, t- tell my audience a little bit about your background, what you have done in the past? Yeah, absolutely. And David, I want to say thank you for having me here, and thank you to your audience for even listening to us. Um, you know, it's a uh, it's a blessing to be able to come on to a show like yours as well. So. Um, my background is, it's a little tough, you know, sometimes it's, it's laying out a background for people, um, of where to start, but, uh, I've had a lot of ups and downs, uh, along the entrepreneurial journey, uh, throughout the years. I've been in finance related places for most of the 20 years. Um, and along that time I've opened up 13 different businesses. Um, I would say 10 of them, I learned how not to run a business. And so, uh, three of them, uh, I hit, you know, uh, uh, seven figures plus I've done over $200 million in sales, uh, throughout my companies. And, uh, along the way I, um, you know, was fortunate enough to hit a milestone at 27 years old to be a millionaire on paper and mm-hmm. at 28 years old to be, uh, bankrupt. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, and then my journey from there started to dive into personal finance um, and to drive into entrepreneurship and learn how to run businesses and learn how to do things a lot better than I did them the first go around. And uh, now my message is to try and share those things to help people learn it at a younger age uh, than I did, because I realized that we don't talk about personal finance. We don't talk about entrepreneurship. We don't talk about the successful mindsets that it takes to be a high achiever. Uh, We don't offer those opportunities to many young people, and I have made it my mission to try and bring that voice to the world. Okay. And will you say, Al, you started 13 companies in total. Uh, What would be the biggest success? Which one is your biggest success? Yeah, I... um, I built a company to, um, I built an RV dealership. So recreational vehicles, motorhomes, travel trailers, kind of things. Um, we got up to over $50 million a year in sales and uh, I was able to actually sell that company to a publicly traded company. And, um, you know, so I guess monetarily that would probably be the most successful. Um, for me, I think the most learning I had was the first company, which I opened up a mortgage company, uh, 24 years old. I had been out of college and working for a little over a year, maybe, and decided that we were going to bootstrap a company together. And uh, we did just that. <laughs> I bought a half million dollar house. I bought a $200,000 duplex and, uh, and started a company all with $300 in the bank. And so uh, we, we, we I had a lot of bumps and bruises along the way with that company. We only had enough money to last for the first month. And uh, it takes about 30 days to do a mortgage. So mm-hmm. it was sink or swim uh, right out of the bat, right, right out of the gate, man. We had, to, we had to get going. You know, I remember there was four of us working in the office the first day, and we only had w- enough money for one phone. And so mortgages are done. Uh, we did everything through lead generation uh, on the Internet. And uh, there's four of us that need to use the phone. So we literally we're just taking, like, rotations <laughs> to try to call our customers <laughs> and make things happen because it was uh, – we, and we built from there. And, um, you know, two years later had a, uh, had a seven figure business and commissions and, um, you know, tons of millions of dollars of mortgages actually done, but, uh, we hit seven figures and commissions and had 25 people working at the dealers at the, um, at the brokerage at that time. And, uh, thought I'd really figured out a lot of stuff, you know? So I, what I really figured out was how to make money and I didn't really figure anything about how to keep it or manage it. <laughs> mm-hmm, yeah. All right. Well, you mentioned that it, I believe that company got you to become a millionaire on paper when you were 27 years old, and then you went bankrupt a year later. What happened there? Can you tell us a little? Yeah. yeah. So, um, as a lot of people uh, kind of start off, and we actually run our personal lives like this a lot, um, is that we're managing what's in the bank account and not really planning for uh, good, solid financial footings. Yeah. And I think it's very applicable to today because you, you know, you have these kind of black swan events, like we just had coronavirus and COVID and, you know, people having their businesses shut down for them. Uh, a lot of those businesses are not going to open back up because it's usually $1 in, $1 out. You know, they're kind of, they're passed through and they don't think about the um, balance sheet at all and having cash reserves and 
paying down creditors so that when you need money that you can borrow that money to get you through on a, on a, on a other side of it. And so I was in that scenario. Uh, we were running extremely fast. I had my commissions that, uh, and the deals that I were working on were getting bigger and bigger and I was doing less um, but what I traditionally did, which was, you know, finance people buying homes or refinancing. And I built a real estate brokerage to complement the mortgage company. Then I built a uh, construction company to build homes to complement the real estate company and the mortgage company. And then I built a, uh, a website for um, like wholesalers and property investment foreclosures and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And what I, I, I was always dollar in dollar out. What's in the bank account. This is what I'm going to take out, you know, whatever it is. And it was like, I got the next big commission coming. And what happened is, you know, what happens in all business cycles and all life is that when, when the music stops, you know, if you don't have a chair, you're, you're done. And that was me. And I was levered to the hilt. And yeah. uh, within a year, you know, $700,000 in the hole um, of different things that I owed between foreclosure and credit cards and, um, and uh, IRS liens. And, you know, I, I, I did all the companies just vanished in six months because I didn't have any sustainability. And what I learned from that is that a lot of companies operate that way. And a lot of us operate our personal lives that way. And it's more money is made in downturns than it is in bull markets. And I'd never heard that before. I never really understood it because when downturns come, if you uh, double down and you focus and you get, you either get leaner and you survive or uh, opportunities come up all over the place because, you know, if you've got capital or you have uh, expertise, you are sought off after even more and you can, you can actually gain market share through those times. Yeah. No, that I think a lot of people can totally relate to, to your story there because most businesses, they cannot survive without cash flow in a month or two months. Right. And a lot of like right now, especially right now with the pandemic and COVID-19, a lot of brick and mortar businesses, they are pretty much going bankrupt right now because they can't operate. They don't have any cash flow coming in. So I'm sure your story can, a lot of people can relate with that. So um, what was the, what was the turning point for you? So you went bankrupt and then what, what was the turning point? What helped you turn it around? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, what I did end up doing was um, I went hard after a job that I really, really wanted. Um, at the time I was kind of toxic because it was the recession crash of real estate basically. And all four of my businesses were in real estate. Mm -hmm. And so when I went to, I, I thought, Oh, you know, immediately I thought, well, I've built all this stuff. Like any company would be lucky to hire me. You know, I still had that kind um, mm -hmm. of attitude. This will be great. Well, as I started applying, um, I realized very quickly that that was not the case <laughs> and, and I needed to kind of reset myself. And so I actually became a commercial banker. It was a dream job for me. I fought extremely hard to get the position. Um, you know, when I say that I applied for 25 of the positions and within 10 minutes I had 24 rejection letters and the only one they offered me was like a $20,000 a year job in the middle of the state of Florida, like swampland. And I was like, no, you know, I, I got the recruiter um, and I just, you know, wouldn't let them say no to interviewing me. And uh, I got that position. And so what I, you know, I, there was a time where, where right before that um, I was sitting on the back porch of this condo at the beach, you know, uh, I, would, I was in foreclosure in and was losing everything and uh, just sitting out there and my wife and I just kind of started laughing about it I'm like what are we gonna do you know like this is crazy so because it had been crashing on me so hard that I just I never really thought about that it was always kind of like just reactionary and I flipped the switch and said you know what it's time to just get going man and I, I was like I swear I will never ever be in this position again and I made that determination that I was like if other people could be successful and other people could um, you know live the lives they wanted to live that I just wanted to find out how they were doing it and just started copying their success. Right. And I started seeing that patterns. And I did that when I became a commercial banker, because I got to go into so many different businesses. Um, I mean, I was in several thousand businesses in three years and I saw patterns of success um, from business owners that it didn't matter what industry they were in, but they knew their numbers. 
they knew their product, they adjusted quickly, and then they knew change was going to come, and yeah. they didn't know what that change was going to be, but they were preparing to always keep their you know eyes open and to be nimble and uh, and do those things. And I saw a lot of people who lost a lot of revenue, but because they were able to weather the storm, came out on the other side of it and actually made a lot more money after the recession than they did going into it when their revenue numbers were much higher. And I'd never thought about it that way. I always, you know, you see, especially in today's world, right, with Instagram and digital marketing and stuff, it's always like, you know, where's your, what's your revenue number? Where's your co two comma club award, you know, and that kind of stuff. They don't talk about the the ad spend, the, the, the money that it had to produce those kinds of things, you know. And so uh, when I figured that out, I would, I had realized also that I didn't, I needed to do not just in a business setting, but I needed to do it in my personal life. And so I started to do those things. And I, I dove really hard into personal finance and, um, and I started talking about it. You know, I was very open about what struggles I was dealing with when I was talking to people. And you know what I found is that maybe we were on different levels of struggle, mm -hmm. but we all wanted somebody to talk to about these things. And it becomes a very taboo subject, you know, and I found that a lot of my closer friends, like I was telling them what I was like, yeah, I just got this bill in the mail and it's $30,000 and I don't know what to do about it. And they're, they would be like, well, here's what I would do. And here's what I would do. But I was open and willing to talk about these things. And so I was able to solve problems a lot faster. And I kind of realized that like, there's really no reason to have that stigma, right? There's really no reason to not talk about money and not talk about entrepreneurship and struggles and those kinds of things. And that helped advance um, where I was in my head much quicker by doing that. And so that's kind of where, um, when I got the opportunity to go into the dealerships, um, you know, we took it from $8 million to $51 million in six years. Nice. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, a, and it was, a, I had all the struggles along the way. You know, there was many, many sleepless nights, many, many 70 hour plus work weeks. Like, um, you know, but I also, uh, I got my house in order so that yep. I was able to, to weather any kind of storm that might've came through, you know, I got myself debt free over that time period. I paid everything off mm -hmm. took my credit score from a 480 or 490 credit score to actually recently I hit 850, which is a perfect credit score. I'd never seen one before. <laughs> um, and now it affords me a lot of opportunities, you know, that I didn't have before because I, I worked on those things constantly. I turned off the TV. I, you know, became obsessed with listening to it because I figured whatever I fed my mind was the things I was going to think about. And I started chipping away at it and I made a 10 year plan. And in that 10 year plan, I included wanted to be retired at 39 years old. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I had told everyone in college I wanted to be a millionaire by the time I was 30 and I got many people laughed at me and you know I had some believers and then <laughs> probably more probably more laughs than believers but I did it and then I figured out it wasn't all it was cracked up to be so what I decided was I was gonna okay I was gonna get so financially fit that I was gonna be able to be retired at 39 and then I was gonna have enough passive income to come in the door mm -hmm. and enough assets and income streams that if something went wrong again I wasn't gonna be caught like I was before and uh and, and I was, I was, I determined what I needed to do by each year. I worked backwards. Where do I need to be here? Where do I need to be there? And then I determined by that when I got, okay, I know where I want to be at the end of year two. I know where I want to be at the end of year one to get the end of the year one. What do I got to do each month? And then it was like, okay. And I put a plan in place. And then when things came up, you know, opportunities to, you know, uh, get away from my plan. I always look back at that plan and if that thing was more important then that's what I stuck to. And, I, and it gave me a why to, and it gave me a, um, it gave me a target to aim at. And by doing that, it was easy for me to uh, determine where I wanted to tell my money to go as opposed to before wondering where it went. Okay. I see. So, um, I mean, is there a book or something? Where did you learn all these stuff? Cause I mean, for me, I, I didn't like, I, I didn't know anything about money or financial literacy because in school they never teach any of those stuff that's how i feel like when i went to high school and university i didn't learn anything about money how to budget how to get out of debt how do you like where do you learn all those stuff 
Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I personally feel that like we should be teaching this earlier and earlier in life because it's going to solve a lot of problems for people. Um, and so specifically, I just dove into things like I dove into Dave Ramsey, which is you know probably the world's largest get out of debt financial uh, literacy person. Yeah. Um, but by the time you get to Dave Ramsey, you've usually had an event in your life um, where you had to make a budget or you had like there's a turning point where it's like, I can't take this anymore. It's like a breaking point. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, I, I find that as I talk to people, it becomes more and more apparent that we all know the problem, right? We all know the problem is we don't teach these things. We don't even talk about them, right? We don't teach them in school. We just expect our parents to give it to us and the parents don't want to talk to our kids about it and they don't know where to start. And it's just like, well, I'll just let you go until you make your mistakes, right? And we kind of, but we don't preemptively do those things. And by doing that, I feel like we strap our kids into losing quite a bit of time um, in their lives stuck in the debt trap if they ever get out of it, right? And then at that point, you're kind of on the hamster wheel and you're waiting for that big, uh, that big moment that comes down the road and you don't know it's coming, but you just, it feels like more and more weights on your shoulders consistently until eventually it's a breaking point. And yeah. so for me, I dove in. I would say there's two parts of that. So um, I would say that uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad was one, as I talk to high achievers and people that have found success on themselves, mm -hmm. most everyone points to that book to change the way that they saw the world, right? And yeah. I'm one of them. I, it was, I've read it several times. I have it on audiobook and every now and then I throw it on and I just feel like every time I listen to it, I feel like I see the world differently, yeah. you know? And the other thing was, and so that was more in a, uh, in, in a, in a, in a, paradigm for me the way I see the world and then the other part was I just started taking action right I started making a budget nobody wants to talk about budgets right because it's like oh I have to tell you where my money went and I have to take responsibility for where I spend my money yeah. and it's like yeah. I don't really want to talk about that but that's not really what it is what it is is you're actually telling your money where to go to right and you're telling it to say hey this is I'm in control you know right. and so that when you go out and you buy that thing that maybe you want you know that $200 thing or $100 thing or $50 dinner or whatever it is you don't have that guilt because you planned that you made that decision that fifty dollars is allocated for that right and so you can go out and enjoy it and you can spend your time um you also have a much um a much better home life you know if you're if you're married and if you have kids especially like the more people you add into that dynamic if you have a money stress inside the home it becomes the like it becomes this big monster in there, you know, and it causes more divorces and families breaking up and kids, you know, I've talked to so many people that they knew when uh, the bills were coming in hard because, you know, dad and mom were stressed out and angry and yeah. they, they, they started early learning their relationship with money needed to be a stressful one. And then they lose the idea that it's a tool and that there are benefits to it as well. And so you start telling yourself a money story. And the thing is, is like, once you identify what your money story is, then you can rewrite it. Mm -hmm. So what would you, what would your number, the number be the number one tip for somebody who's, who's struggling financially right now and who are probably in debt, what would be your number one tip for that person? Yeah. I usually like to use two words, right? Which are take action. Mm -hmm. um, the longer you wait, the more you're going to struggle, it's going to get worse because you're going to get in your own head and you're going to start to feel the pressures that are coming down on you. And so if you're struggling, you can't put your hands up and say, I'm not good with money. You can't put your hands up and say, Oh, I can't, there's no way out of this. Like I am telling you from somebody, if you are not worse off than $700,000 in the hole with no job and the IRS calling you every day, like you're starting in a better place than I was. Right. And I was able to turn this thing around in a matter of, you know, it took 10 years, but along, I had not had a great time along the way. Don't, don't let me get you know, wrong about that. But if you're struggling with things like just start to face them. And I would say, just start to talk about them, find somebody that you can talk to about it, find a friend, find a family member, find somebody in your church, find somebody that you can start to just express what you're dealing with. And then the monster just becomes a reality, right? It's not really there. And so you can then start to make decisions. Okay. Put it on paper, right? Where does my money go and start to analyze these things. And it's just like any other problem. You start to figure out, uh, okay, what are the inputs? 
what are the uh, what are we getting out of that right and as you start to do those things and you take that action and you start to make a budget and you start to talk about money and you start to um, you know seek information because what you what you put into your brain is what's going to come out on the other side it's a lot like a computer right garbage yeah. in garbage yeah. out and so if you don't like the results that you're getting out change the input and so mm -hmm. in that in that regard start reading about things that you want to be better at yeah, if you're yeah. struggling financially because you don't make enough money like right? which is what a lot of people say i don't make enough money so i don't have to worry about these things then how do you begin to make more money so you have to invest in yourself if you're not taking action and you punch that clock for 35 to 40 hours a week there's 100 i think 168 hours in a week right um you 40 of them are at the at the job you have 128 hours to figure out something else to do right put in some time and some investment in your body and put some time and investment in your mind and you'll see that it doesn't, it's not an overnight thing, but as you build, those things start to compound and you start to add more and more value. And guess what? You start to make more and more money. Mm -hmm. Okay. So first they need to be aware of their financial situation. Where does the com money coming in and where does it coming out? You have to budget plan for it. And then now you got to figure out, okay, how can I earn more money? What can I do what, where can I add more value than to other people so that I can increase my income. Right. So. Yeah. I like to think that, you know, I'm, I'm really financially astute now because I'm out here talking about money and stuff, but really honestly, the, the one thing to do is like, you got to spend less and make more. Right. And okay. so if those two things happen, <laughs> you'll have more of a bottom line and yeah. you can get into the technical portions of it. Like tracking your net worth. Like for me, that yeah. was the one that like, I, I just made an Excel spreadsheet and mm -hmm. I put all the things that I thought were assets and what the values were to them. So I had a house, yeah. I had a car, I had some jewelry and I had some TVs and yeah. I just started putting like little line items. Right. And then on the bottom side of it, I just put all the stuff that I owed money on. So mortgage, credit cards, um, you know, up top you got bank account as well. If I had your retirement stuff, which I didn't at the time, but, um, and then, you add up all the things that you have that's a balance and you subtract all the things that you owe. Mm -hmm. And at the bottom of that, you're going to have a net worth. Right. And so for me, when I started tracking this every single month, I would do it every month and I would say, okay, well, what's my house worth now? You know, I would mm -hmm. go on Zillow and pull that number off. And then I'd say, well, my car is probably $500 less, you know, whatever it is. And I would, I was trying to be realistic on my asset side yep. and then on my liability side, you know, I was, I was knocking these numbers down, but I was seeing the bottom grow and it wasn't big at first, you know, like maybe it was a couple hundred bucks in a month that I had changed my net worth, but I had never thought of it that way before. Right. I'd never thought about like, well, okay. So if I can get that to 300, if I got, if I went up $300, like it became a game to me in my head, you know, and it became a game that I wanted to win really bad. And so when I didn't want to stay that extra hour at work, I did because I wanted to do more than that 300. And so mm -hmm. as I started doing those things, I started adding to those. It didn't feel like I was just paying off credit. It felt like I was adding to my net worth, right? And that was a motivator for me because I wanted to see that thing grow really bad, especially from where I came from. And as I was kind of tracking those things, then that was my motivation. So that's why I'm trying to say like the first, the, the best advice is to take action. If you start doing this today, yeah then you should have done it yesterday, right? And then that's what most people, well, I don't have time. And you have time, trust me, don't don't kid yourself. If you don't wanna do it, say so you don't wanna do it, but don't tell you don't have time to make a budget, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you can find an hour for something this important, I promise you, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> and there's lots of stuff out there. You can Google, you know, you can, you can find templates if you don't wanna make one, like whatever it is, but like just start taking the little bit of action and realizing that it's not as scary as you think. Mm -hmm. you know it's just it's you, once you start to kind of to to break through you know um for me now it's podcasting right it's going live on on social media and those kind of things yeah. i am yeah. not comfortable with this stuff you yeah. know yeah. i was like man what do i what am i gonna do what am i gonna say like i don't you know it's not perfect it's not this and you just kind of have to step out of your comfort zone and a lot of people you know i that a lot of people handle that no problem right and then they're terrified to do anything about finances or money or all those kind of things. I'm like the exact opposite of that, right? Like it doesn't bother me at all because I've been doing it for 20 years. So it doesn't bother me at all to go out and put my face out there to do these things and to step out the unknowns. So for a lot of people, if you haven't taken that time to get your own financial house in order, like start, 
you're, you probably won't be perfect at it at first. I pretty much guarantee it. But I'll tell you this, you'll get better at it every single day or every single month that you start to focus on it. And it's something that's going to affect your entire life. It's going to affect your kid's life. It's going to affect your family tree. It's going to affect your legacy. And it's going to affect the home life that you have and the relationships that you build. If you're an entrepreneur, if you're not in a good position financially, and you're, it's going to affect your business. And so yeah, it almost yeah. feeds itself, right? And so if you're constantly stressed about how you're going to pay the mortgage, you're not thinking about how you can further the business into the next thing mm -hmm. that's going to drive the money that would have came in. And so by being able to leave that at the door or feel comfortable about it or have a plan for the money that you have and you're telling mm -hmm. it where to go, you now can make confident, better decisions, which is one of the reasons for money talkers. For me, it's so important that we talk to our kids about this because if they have the ability to go out and be financially free and go after the things that they want, they're going to go out in the world. And they're going to solve bigger problems than they would have prior to just worrying about their student loans, right? And they're going to go out and they're going to drive these, they're going to push uh, society forward and they're going to make the world a better place because they're going to have the freedom to go out and push these things forward and have confidence and do it the right way. And we can give that to them instead of wasting their talent for 20 years, worrying about their student loan at a job they hate. Like we can push them into uh, being able to, you know, give back into charities or go out and start the next company that solves the next world's big problems, right? They've got the ability to go out and do that. And as a parent, you know, I can tell you that the only thing that I want for my kids is I want to have a relationship with them, right? I want them to be able to talk to me about these subjects that maybe I learned something about. And, uh, and, and if I don't start doing that early, then it becomes much harder to try and get a 27 year old to listen to you about money yeah than it is to try and get a seven-year-old to listen to you about money and realize that they can come talk to you about these things. So if you make it taboo, don't expect them to come back to you and talk to you in 20 years from now because they're not going to trust your advice. They're not going to have that relationship built. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. And the thing is that the school system doesn't teach anything about money, about financial literacy, how to budget, like I said earlier. Like kids nowadays are clueless about these things. Like I'm lucky because when I was younger, I has happened to read a book, right? Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I said, happened to read that book and then it's changed my mindset, my perspective about money. But a lot of my friends or people that I observe around me, they have no clue about money. Like they don't know how to budget. They don't know how to, you know, save money and invest their money. And yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Like it's very important to teach kids about money very early on. And also, in my culture, in the Asian culture, money is, is a taboo subject that parents don't talk about a lot because well, to a lot of family, a lot of Asian parents, if you talk too much about money, like your greedy is not good, money is evil, money is bad, you shouldn't be you know, talking about money all the time. But really, I mean, we all need money. Like, it's part of our society. We need money to live, right? So, and I think that subject is very important. Kids need to know about money. I, I I've been on both sides of that coin. You know, I've, I've definitely had zero dollars and I've definitely not. <laughs> and I can tell you what, I, it's a lot better, you know, knowing about things than it was not knowing about them. Right. And I've had a lot of people kind of, I actually I had someone in an interview um, ask me and they were like, well, what do you say about this? You know, teaching kids about money in school is, uh, is not very efficient. You know, they don't, they don't pay attention. They don't do those things. And I'm like, I go, how efficient is it to teach them? Or how effective is it to not teach them about money? Right? Like, I know that I was taking tests in history class and because I was memorizing facts and then an hour later, I'd, I'd, I'd get the bubbles, you know, Scantron thing done and then I'd, it'd be out my brain. I wouldn't even think about it again. But if you had told me that, listen, if you put away 40 bucks a month from 16 to 76, and you don't do nothing else with your whole life. You put it into an S and P 500 fund that's got zero, you know, basically zero fees. If you just return the average, you'll make two million dollars. I guarantee I would have cut that fact a whole lot faster than I would have picked up, you know, why I'm in a pottery class, right? And so, you know, it's just I don't think the curriculum was designed at the time um, that you had to be more self-sufficient. And in today's world, you have to be able to take care of your own retirement. You have to take care of your own insurance. You have, you don't have a pension. You're not going to work for a company for 45 years and get a gold watch. And then they give you a pension and you have your, 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 you know, that's, that's when you can go out and enjoy life. Like 
we have a lot more freedoms today, but we're also in it for ourselves a lot more. So if we go in and we're doing a disservice by not talking about any of these things to kids, like you're going to get a test with money, mm -hmm. right? Constantly. You're going to have to try to keep taking these things over and over again. Well, you can either help your kids study for it and give them some of the, the, the course material before the big questions come, or you can just say, you know what? Uh, you've never opened a history book. Here's your history test, right? And so you you know the results are going to be bad. Like it's not set up for you to win. You know that's why we're signing we're signing these student loans to kids. You know they're 18 years old. They don't even how to know how to make their own signature, and uh, you know and they're trying to sign paperwork. And we're debting them with 200 grand. Never, uh, never ever once have they been taught anything about <laughs> how it's going to affect their life down the road, right? And how it's going to pay this thing back and how they're, the opportunities they're going to miss because they're going to be stuck in these debt payments. And What's even worse, they go into, you know, college or university, they take a course or a subject that they're not even interested in, but they've been told that they can get a job. But then by the time they graduate, they find out that they couldn't even get a job with that degree. And now they stuck with a big student loan and a piece of paper that doesn't really help them in any way. So yeah. even worse, you're like me and you leave with 10 hours left, <laughs> <laughs> right? I, I was fortunate enough to have scholarships, but, um, you know, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I wanted, I didn't know anything about jobs or, or, exactly. or careers or entrepreneurship. I didn't know any of this stuff. I just knew I wanted to make money, right? I went to school to be a marine biologist and I ended up in a finance, uh, as a finance guy. Right. And so, um, it, it is, we don't explore a lot of things that are very, very valuable in our, in our school system. And I think that um, for me, I don't expect the outcome, right? Like I don't expect, like if you went into a school system and you said, okay, we're going to teach about money. And now 100% of the kids in here are going to be great with money. No, I don't believe that at all. Right. It's not, it'd be dumb and foolish to think that that would work. But I can tell you this, if you went into a school system and for four years you had finance classes and personal finance classes and you learned about things like, there's a subset, I don't know what the percentage is going to be, but there's a subset of kids that are going to be exponentially better off the rest of their lives because we taught about this, you know? And I, I saw a stat earlier um, from Experian, you know, which is one of the credit bureaus. They do a lot of um, surveys and things. And they found out that Generation Z, which is in the school systems now, 68% uh, of them wanted financial literacy taught in school. I never thought about it as a kid. You know, it didn't even cross my mind. I didn't you even know, even what, know what financial literacy means. I didn't know what that meant. Yeah, I have no idea what that was. And there's 68% of kids are like responding because, you know, they've been on computers and internet and learning and they got all the YouTube shows and these things are like, they, and they've been through two, you know, really bad recessions, like the worst we've had, you know, we just shut the country down for three months. And then in 08, we basically had the worst thing since the you know great depression. And uh, so they've been through these things and they're like, they're watching it. So, yeah, they know like the kids are very, very observant about um, about money. They don't know. They know what they don't know. Like I never knew what I didn't know. They know they don't they're not getting good information. They're not being taught those things. And so for me, it's a it's a, a life goal, you know, would be to I guess to the big bucket list would be like to get this into schools. Right. Yeah. That would be. But that's a glacier you're trying to move. You know, yeah. it's a very big, audacious, hairy goal. Right. So what can I control? I can control that what I bring to parents and how I bring them together. And if I can give them the tools so that the people who want the information have a pathway to go down there and get the information and it gives them a handheld piece to go. Because I think a lot of parents have a few, have a few big holdbacks, which is they feel like either they don't know enough to teach, they don't know where to start because it's such a big subject. And three, they really don't wanna talk about it because they're gonna have to probably dig a little bit into their stuff, right? And so that becomes a little bit personal, but I will tell you this, if you want the best for your kids, that has to be a bigger why than not wanting to talk to them about your own mistakes. Mm -hmm. If you have that goal, and I think every parent does, um, and you know what, this, the courses and the material doesn't, you don't necessarily have to be a parent to take these things to learn about them. Yeah. It's broken down in very simple steps of what is it at first, and then it's how do you use it, you know? Um, if you just got a little bit better, you're going to be have a significant trajectory change of a kid's financial life. You know, I had a sales manager teach me once. Said, "Hey, you do read sales books?" I said, "No." And he said, "Why?" He said, "I said they're all the same." He said, "You read a whole book and you got two percent better." I was like, 
yeah, I'd say maybe 2% better. Uh, it seems like a lot of work for 2%. And he said, well, what if you read one every month? I was like, okay. He goes, end of the year, you'd be 24% better. And four years from now, you'd be 100% better than you are today. And I was like, okay, I'll start reading sales books, man. Like, <laughs> and I did, I started doing this stuff. So I feel like the same thing. Like if we just start opening these concepts and these yeah. doors, kids are naturally curious, especially if they, because I mean, I haven't met anybody who's like, yeah, I want to be broke my whole life, right? They want the things, they just don't know what they don't know yet. And as a, if you're any step ahead of them in life, you know, a 17 year old can teach a 14 year old a whole lot about money. Yeah. You know, so as a parent, like, uh, and as a kid, like, if you go to seek this information, you're going to learn a lot from people that are just, they only need to be one step ahead of you. Yeah. And you, and you can save a lot of time and open a lot of doors and have that conversation. But again, it's the two words that I said before, it's taking action. And it's not even about the kids. It's about for the adult, the parents as well. Right. Cause you learn too, like by learning, educating yourself about financial literacy, you are going to improve your own financial situation, your family financial situation. And then what the kids will learn from you as an example, they're going to grow up to have a much better, you know, relationship with money. So, yeah, absolutely. You're going to open that door to take down that taboo of like, well, I should be scared of this or I shouldn't be doing it. Or, I mean, if you sit down and you, you guys do a household budget and, and you do your own budget and you have your kid do theirs and, and they figure out these things and there's simple tasks you can do with these kind of things. Mm -hmm. Like they're going to get in the habit of doing that. But if they get in the habit of doing it at 16 instead of 36, like you've added 20 years of compounding for them. Right. Um, and, and so it, maybe they don't get all, hundred concepts yeah maybe they get 10 but one now you can talk about it you can have different conversations at the dinner table if you want right and you can talk about these things what they learn have them learn it and teach it to you you know or you learn it and teach it to them because if you if you have to teach something it's going to stick in you much better right because one you have to have, have like developed some sort of mastery so you have to pay attention yeah. but two um as you're as you're teaching it it's very hard not to live it Right. Yeah. So you can't, you can't exactly go preaching it and then, and then not do it. Right. So, yeah. because you're a hypocrite, right. And internally you'll feel that. So it makes you, you kind of teaching. And as you're teaching those things, you're going to get better at it. And if you say, well, I made a lot of mistakes. Okay. Those are in the past. What are you going to do about it? Right. What's the actionable step to go and get better at it? And maybe you don't go from zero to a hundred percent in one month, but if you start that pathway and you know, it's kind of like I was telling you with the personal, uh, when I had my net worth calculator, you know, I was ahead a couple hundred bucks to my net worth of a month and I was so excited about it. And then as I got going, those numbers got bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. And I, and I, and I wanted them to get bigger and I was seeing the, at the results of my action and I wasn't scared of it anymore. And I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, um, embarrassed by all the dumb things I had done, you know, and how I ended up in this really terrible, awful situation. You know, and I was laughing at it at that point. I was like, I can't believe how, how, uh, how much debt I was. <laughs> I can't believe how like bad that situation was, you know? And it's like, uh, but if you're there, like you just have to start walking, man. You can't run until you start crawling and then you got to walk and then you can run, you know? And so hopefully, uh, if people listen to this, like mm -hmm. that gets some motivation because you need to figure out that you got to have a why it's got to be bigger. Do you want to feel this the rest of your life? Do you want your kids to feel this their whole lives? And if not, then take action and start doing something about it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're pretty much near the end of uh, the interview. So um, I know you have a podcast that talk about this topic a lot, talk about money, financial literacy. Uh, what is the podcast called? Yeah. So the podcast is called Money Talkers. It's mm -hmm. on every kind of uh, distribution channel you can find, iTunes, yeah. um, Spotify and everything. And so mm -hmm. um, the premise is this, is that we're, we're trying to give – um, I, I bring in some of the top level coaches, high achievers, fantastic parents, um, yeah. you know, uh, experts in their fields. And we're talking about this because we're going to talk about personal finance, but we're going to talk about entrepreneurship and we're also going to talk about successful mindsets and what we need to do. So mm -hmm. in the, in the interviews, we dive into people's backgrounds and we kind of deconstruct how they got where they are. So you don't just see the end result, yeah. but we also do a high impact series where it's an actionable podcast. I don't want you just to listen. I want you to go act, right? Yeah. I want you to go start opening those doors and talk to your kids. And so we always kind of end up in the, um, in the high impact series of 
pushing the, the pushing the needle forward to try and open up those doors. Okay, and I know you also have like some sort of training program for parents who want to teach their kids about money as well, right? Where can yeah. you find more information about that? So the two places I would recommend do is one, if you're on Facebook, go to uh, the search bar and type in money talkers and come join the Facebook group because mm -hmm. there's a community there of like-minded people and it's growing quickly. Uh, the second thing is um, for coursework, we're going to go through the moneytalkers.com and you can uh, sign up there as the, as the releases come out and the yeah. uh, and, and the coursework comes out, you're able to then, um, you know, you'll be on the front lines to get notified for those things. Sounds good. All right. Thank you very much for your time today, Cody. I definitely learned a lot and I hope my, my audience did learn something as well. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate you uh, letting me come on and talk to your audience as well. Um, I hope they've gotten some value out of it. Yeah, my pleasure. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.